Welcome to the Messy Antics Podcast, a podcast about all things Messianic Judaism. Each episode, we will be sharing our opinions as we tackle some of the biggest issues in Messianic Judaism. Now, here's your hosts, Rabbis Eric, David, Jonathan, and Toby. Hey everyone, welcome to Messy Antics. Uh, today we're going to kick off a conversation uh, about um, kind of what our looks, what our life looks like now that we've exited the spring uh, high holy days. So we've made it through Passover, we've made it through unleavened bread, through Shavuot, and now we're. Uh, Rabbi Toby and I were discussing, uh, trying to figure out the musical terms. The musical terms, you know, are we? In, are we we've we've come through the crescendo, you know, we've of the uh, spring of the spring, and now we're in the uh, we, we and and we've also hit the decrescendo yeah. um, at the end, and now we're in the valley. And I, I could, for the life of me, cannot remember what well, the we valley were is looking called. Up, we were looking up the orchestral terms for what's really quiet. Yeah, and and I said, and I looked it up. I actually literally wrote into Google what is what's the musical term for really quiet and it's pianissimo pianissimo so yeah because piano means quiet pianissimo like isimo yeah. means very quiet and I wasn't good enough for John and John's like no no it sounds like something else I'm like dude I <laughs> that's what it is it's very quiet yeah it's not you know but yes the crescendo of of yeah. Passover into Shavuot yeah we're kind of we're, we, we've wrapped up and yeah my my eighth grade music education is failing me. <laughs> We're in the decrescendo into the pianissimo of yeah. the summer before the crescendo of. You mean you're learning to march in the military? Didn't feed you any of these terms too? Yeah. No, dude. All you need is a drum and didn't know the difference between left and right. You know, it was that. That's third or at least grade. Be able to fake it. Yeah, yeah. That's third grade. So I, I made it through that at least. Um, but we, yeah. So we're in the summer now, um, which is the pianissimo. Kind of, yep, which is the pianissimo of. Uh, of, of the high holy day, of the of the biblical of calendar the Jewish year, cycle, the, cycle. the Jewish cycle, and it's yeah, it's it's interesting because every year, and the more you spend time in messianic ministry, um, and and even just being in, within um, even within messianic Judaism, I think most people don't really recognize it, but definitely when you're in ministry, you absolutely recognize like those those high and lows, yeah. Uh, and the summer is definitely like we're almost like, it's almost like we're in like public school or something like we oh, yeah. we get the the summer break you know or summer off or, or whatever we get yeah. you know kind of June through August we get uh, time to I guess. I, I don't know if I want to say recuperate because summer's also like busy for us with conferences and you know yes. traveling to things. So yeah, but at least generally speaking, in those conferences, with exception of maybe a few short minutes, uh, well, I, I say generally speaking, but that's not true right. in my case or, or Rabbi Toby's this year. But uh, mm-hmm. generally speaking, in those conferences, we really don't have a lot to do. Like we're not running the sure. Summer. We get to kind of breathe. Sure, but so in a general ministry sense, summer is kind of a season to kind of. Um, you know, breathe out, relax, um, and so um, a lot of us will be you know, not maybe not so keyed up <laughs> for for the next three months, um, just because there's not as much to do other than just you know kind of do the week, Shabbat service, Shabbat yeah. service, weekly studies, you know, going yeah. and visiting with people as as uh, needed, that kind of stuff, and um, yeah. So anyway, what's um, I guess we kind of want to hit on like what are some. Uh, What's it feel like to be able to breathe? Well, yeah. What, do, what does it feel like to be able to breathe? What do you do in the summer? Yeah. You know, and even and I even have some ideas like that so that I want to try out this summer that I really didn't think about until this spring. Um. So, any of y'all want to well, answer a, one of those? For what? Like, what am I answering? So, what do you? What do you? How do you view the summer for yourself? Okay. Like, what well, is it, you when know? I was. Um, when I was a youth leader, that's actually. I mean, you know, speaking from a youth ministry perspective, that's when things are amped up. That's when it's like okay, we're gonna go to a we're gonna go to a retreat or we're gonna go rafting or yeah, because all the kids know. are out of school because all the kids are out of school. Which congratulations but, to all the grad uh, all the graduates by yeah, the way. But for, from a from a congregational leadership standpoint, um, well, this is my first real uh, summer, you know, starting as because you know when I came in last year, uh, it was. Um, July was when we moved here, but you know, uh, Rabbi David was very um, intentional about like you know I don't want you doing fully anything until September. So mm-hmm. I really wasn't you know fully involved until then. Yeah. So this is the first one, um, you know. But I mean, you've experienced it from like yeah. worship side, from a worship side, side uh, and, and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. From a youth side, it was when things get amped up. Yeah, uh, it was like when you know parents start saying, "Okay, what are we doing this summer? What's going to be? Are they going to have a big trip? We just need to know to prepare and dates and stuff like that." And you know, and and that was when we were more intentional about doing like a lock in and things like that. 
Um, but uh, at, at, for, for a worship leader, it, it very much is uh, a time to breathe because worship teams work very hard. Yeah. Um, especially for high holy days. Yeah, especially for high holy days. Um, you know, chazans and rabbis, uh, you know, are, are, are running and gunning during those times. Um, but so, yeah, how does it feel? Um, you know, just getting off of Shavuot. Yeah, so... For me, it, you know, Brooke and I are, you know, we're taking a trip next week. So, yeah, we're, we're, we, like, want to get away for a few days. So, definitely, it, there's that feeling of, okay, let's, you know, literally take a breath, but also, you know, kind of get that reconnect with God. Not reconnect like we weren't connected, but, you know, yeah. uh, you know, hit refresh yeah, or whatever. And um, sure, because this year's going by so fast anyway. <laughs> And, and honestly, summer's not that long. I mean, it really isn't. Because yes. really, I mean, August is when you start thinking about high holidays anyway. Yeah. Well, I would think. Summer's only three months. And, like, I mean, we're already in month five of the – month six of this year. Yeah. So, I mean, um, three months will go by like I mean, that. Yeah. And, I mean, you know, like, it, it's a big conference season for the Messianic movement. You have the UMJC, which we'll be attending, and then uh, the Messiah Conference. Um, yeah, you got Messiah early July, and then UMJC is yeah. kind of mid to late July. Which, you know, um, Brooke and I are actually serving in a capacity at the UMJC, so the expenses there are considerably less. Like, we don't have that at the Messiah Conference, so we're not attending because, you know, we're having put all of our um, chips in that bag yeah. because we actually have, you know, like child care and stuff for that time, but, you know, we don't have the money to take all our kids to, yeah. to grant them. Yeah. For the Messiah Conference, I would love that. But yeah, well, we're going to go next summer. Yeah, I, yeah, I want to go to Messiah next year yeah. because it's a um, voting year, voting year. And, and all yeah. that kind of good stuff. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna pinch our pennies and uh, yeah. So maybe I'll I take, can. Yeah, no, I think it'd be great if we all went up at the same time. Yeah. It'd be kind of fun. We're yeah. not going to Messiah this year. I would love to, but we're not yeah. going to Messiah this year because we're in the middle of our project with our house, and I just can't justify yeah. the expense while we've got. Yeah, yeah. While my family's living in a camper, so <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but uh, no, I think to to kind of, I guess, help veer the conversation some, or, mm-hmm. or or maybe start some some direction for it, or whatever. Um, speaking from having been, I know both of you are relatively newer to the congregational leadership side of this. Uh, you know, Rabbi Toby in the last uh, six, seven, six or eight months, and uh, uh, Rabbi Jonathan about two years now, almost two years yeah. now, and um, two, but, and a, two and a half years. Yeah. yeah, but it's been you know uh, the last twenty ish years of my life that I've been in some sort of a facet of, of congregational leadership, rabbinic intern, assistant rabbi, associate rabbi, senior rabbi, what have you. And <clears throat> what's uh, what's really intriguing to me, and I, I, I talk about this with some of my pastor friends, is like, you know, the, in, in the church world, Christmas and Easter, mm-hmm. like, are the big, the, right. the big push, the big drive, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah. so you have extra service for Christmas, extra service for Easter. If you do multiple services, then you've got, you know, extra three or four in one day or whatever. Um, but it's, it's usually like one day in the spring and one day in the winter. And, and that's kind of your big push. And then yeah. everything else is kind of life normal. You may have some extra activities or events or whatever here and there, but for, for us in a culturally Jewish expression of the body of Messiah in Messianic Judaism, um, we still have the the two big seasons a year where there's extra, but that extra is extra. Like, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> yeah, in, right. in the spring, like we just, we just wrapped up Shavuot, right? So we've got uh, Pesach, um, and in Pesach, we usually will have uh, most people, like our congregation of Bradam's the same way. We generally encourage home seders for first night or maybe even second night. And, yeah. uh, and then if you have a congregational seder, like at CMC, we'll do our, we, we encourage home seders for the first night or, and or the second night. And then for, uh, um, uh, our congregational seder, we do it later in the week so that everybody can still have their passport seder at home, but then still be able to get together and do one big seder together as a community. Um, and and then there's also an outreach effort and and uh, stuff like that. But as we we get to that, that's a big push for a really big event. There's a lot that goes into it. As a matter of fact, all in all, in just that one day, 
is about eight hours worth of work and service type stuff with the Seder and everything that goes into that. Then we come out of Passover and we begin the, you know, you've got the counting of the Omer and, and everything going on there. And as we work our way through that seven weeks, we're really ultimately building to Shavuot. And so Shavuot rolls around and you've got another big event. And this year was really uh, busy because we had Shavuot fell on a Thursday, Friday, and so we had Arab Shavuot service at our synagogue, and then we were involved in a Tikkun Lel Shavuot afterwards. It was a this particular one's a virtual one with UMJC, so we were involved with the Tikkun Lel Shavuot through the evening, and then Saturday morning we had service, uh, our regular Shabbat service, and then Sunday, and then uh, Sunday evening. Uh, or Sunday morning, we had a women's event, a men's event in the afternoon, and then Sunday evening we had a big uh, joint thing at Bradam and, and so on that we a bunch of congregations got together for. And so it was like a lot in that one yeah. like four day period. Now we're entering this the summer season where yeah, I guess in general life things kind of speed up a little bit. But uh, now my kids are homeschooled, so like uh, they're at home all the time. Yeah. Uh, so our life really doesn't speed up in terms of our kids being around. But generally speaking, for most people, yeah, life speeds up and. Gets it's a little more complicated as you're navigating all of that. But in the congregational life, uh, we're in kind of a breathing period, a down season where we get to kind of, to some degree, coast for a little bit. I mean, we're yeah. planning for the holidays, but we're kind of coasting a little bit uh, as we approach the High Holy Days in the fall where we've got Rosh Hashanah and and in both of our congregations we do two services on Rosh Hashanah then our regular weekly services are still running 10 days after Rosh Hashanah we have Yom Kippur and we both do two services for Yom Kippur Uh, and then uh, regular Shabbat services in in between and then we've got Sukkot right around the corner after that so within the course of three weeks we have upwards of six to eight extra services uh, all in that time and then during Sukkot uh, both of our congregations actually open our property up for people in our congregation to camp out uh, over the weekend mm-hmm. that falls during Shavuot for community building and, and so on. Um, and so, and, and you know, I, I participate in that. I, I know Rabbi Toby and his family are planning on participating in that this year for community building and being involved with the, the, the people in the congregation and so on. And so in the spring, there's a lot. And in the fall, there's a lot. And then you've got Hanukkah that rolls around and we do a big Hanukkah event and all this. But this season in the summer months is is a uh, kind of a chance to take a breather mm-hmm. and just sit back and, and and be able to like catch our breath and, and refocus, realign uh, uh, as we are preparing, but also kind of bouncing back from. Um, I know one thing that my wife and I have done in the past, we haven't done it as much the last couple of years since really since Hurricane Sally and COVID and everything. But what we were doing for years is uh, after Passover uh, or either after Passover or after Shavuot, we'd get away for a couple of days. Uh, just to, to dis- disconnect, we'd go away for a couple of days, and then the same thing after the fall feast, uh, we would get away for a couple of days just to disconnect and and kind of catch our breath again and relax. And so it's really cool that this season, just that opportunity to stop and breathe and um, uh, kind of find a little sweet relief from the hectic and mm-hmm. the crazy, and kind of get back into some of the normal congregational life, normal family life stuff. Um, I, I know at least for for my wife, I don't know about you guys but my wife sometimes she definitely feels like i prioritize the congregation a little more uh than i should in some and 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 during those seasons that's very much unfortunately the case there is a prioritization of of those things and but this is an opportunity to really kind of refocus and realign in every aspect of our lives from a congregational ministry standpoint uh so yeah just something we wanted to kind of play around with and talk about what life feels like now as we've hit this downslope, this uh, valley, as Rabbi Jonathan was calling it. Yeah. The decrescendo. The decrescendo. To the right. piano, uh, pianissimo. Pianissimo. Well, pianissimo. Well, no. I would not do Italian well. Uh, probably Pian- not. Say it again. Pianissimo. Pianissimo. Yeah, that's it. Pianissimo. It's like saying piano, then adding the issimo. Yeah. yeah okay. Whatever. Yeah. But no, it's... um. It's 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 nice. I mean, it's not that the congregation does nothing, you know, during that summertime. But there's definitely, I think, there's more of a just closed in the summer. No, it's definitely a more relaxed <laughs> approach because like, we're talking about stuff. I mean, we were talking about we we're talking about the possibility of maybe like a, a, doing a mikvah or an immersion. We've talked, you know, we I've been 
talking to David about, you know, just having another, because we usually do the synagogue movie nights. Yeah. Where we do a family friendly movie. That'd be fun. And, uh, and just where people show up, you know, and hang yeah. out and stuff. So it's yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> it's nice when we do it. We'll either do it. The, the, we do it either inside in the sanctuary or if the weather's decent, we'll do it outside when it's cool and comfortable. But we'll yeah. set up a big, like, 100-plus inch screen with projector. Gotcha. And when we do it inside, we run all the audio through our sound, yeah. sound system. Yeah. Yeah. So stuff sounds, like that. You know, fun. so it, things that are that are very laid back as far as if anything's planned. Yeah. But, you know. It's interesting because God, he plans those cycles for a reason, Mm -hmm. you know. I know a lot of them are based around harvests, you know, Mm -hmm. because you have the, you know, the first fruits and and all that. And then you have, you know, and then with with the fall feast, it's the latter rains. Yeah. So there's these, these, you know, God centered it around harvest as well. Mm -hmm. But so then you, but yeah, this, the break is always interesting, Um, you know. Yeah, I think this summer I'm going to try to more intentionally brace because this is actually really the, probably the first summer I've thought about the fact that it is a slower season and so we're doing a little more like family oriented stuff this summer for example we're going to visit with my family in Charleston uh, in June I have a cousin getting married such a cool town and so we're, I love Charleston yeah. I've been there several times and it's just like it's like the perfect mix of history yeah. and be, beautiful architecture. Do a um, tour of the Jewish history. There's a oh, yeah. very very old yeah. Jewish history. We're, um, I it's like I I, t- I basically told my family like if we do if I get to do anything else because we're gonna spend a week in Charleston. My dad will be in from he works overseas, so he'll be in town. And we're gonna spend a whole week there together. And I said if I get to do anything, I have to go to the I forget the name, but the old synagogue in Charleston, which is like, a, it's in the top five of the oldest mm-hmm. in the United States. Yeah. And I was like, I, need, I I have to go see that. And yeah, if there's a Jewish quarter, like yeah. would love to see that. Cause you know, my family is Carolinian. Mm-hmm. Look, my mother's side is Carolinian. And you know, the more I read about the Carolinas and that there was a significant Jewish presence in the Carolinas, from, mostly due to Charleston. From what but, I understand from, cause Danielle and I, uh, I had actually interviewed with a Messianic synagogue in Charleston years ago, uh, before we started CMC, and uh, from from what I understand from the research that I've done and talking with with people that were there, is that what we think of New York City as in terms of kind of being the hub of American Jewry mm-hmm. um, since probably World War Two, yeah, uh, maybe a little bit Post before Holocaust. that, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the Charleston, South Carolina, was that, yeah. for years mm-hmm. upon years. Yeah. Um, and so it's it still has a very 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 active and present Jewish community. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Chabad is there. There's several Orthodox synagogues. There's several conservative, several yeah. Reformed, uh, Reconstruction. Yeah, um, kind of all over the place. There isn't necessarily, at least my understanding, there isn't necessarily like a centralized hub where like the Jewish people all kind of live. Sure, um, there, there not, are parts where yeah. there are heavier populations. Yeah, but they're probably scattered. probably not so anymore. Um, I know that you know in, in my reading about South Carolina's Jewish history, like a lot of them, a lot of them came. Uh, reform, Reform Judaism was the first Judaism yeah. in South Carolina. Um, now, of course, it was Reform Judaism in the 17 and 1800s was, was not different. The, than it is yeah, now. it was not the Reform yeah. Judaism. It was probably more akin to conservative yeah. Judaism yeah. today. Um, but and a lot of them spread out from Charleston into the countryside. And it, like I was reading this article about like. Uh, kind of what we talked about, you know, last week, like on halakhic issues. Like there was almost this very, there was this very embracing attitude between them and a lot of Christian groups in like parts of rural South Carolina and even Charleston. Like there's a lot. There was, um, there was one guy who was an ordained Methodist reverend who was the rabbi of one of the synagogues um, in South Carolina, and he's he was. Uh, another Christian pastor was talking about how he was so appreciative that Reverend so and so was able to come and speak at their church that weekend, and like it was just very interesting cultural dynamic of yeah. like the Judaism was, you know, not assimilated into becoming not Judaism, but they were very embedded into the, um, you know, a lot of it, a lot of them uh, vis- attended Methodist churches if there wasn't a synagogue um, available in their area, which was. You know, I thought yeah. also interesting. It's also um, a really cool aircraft carrier you can tour there. 
Yes, <laughs> <laughs> there is across the across the bay. If you're if you're in the center of Charleston, it's across the yeah little bay there. But I, I always go out to Sumter. Like yeah. every time I go out there, I go to Fort. Sumter. I like that bridge right there by the aircraft carrier. Yeah, it's a big bridge. I but, um, bridges. But so anyway, so that's where we're going. So I'm just this summer for me is like it's the first summer that I've really thought yeah. of as like oh like I actually have time that is not like pressed to get ready yeah. for our holy days and i actually i, w- I want to get your th- thoughts on uh that can be a scary question yes i know i always whenever i say that i always <laughs> think of the song in beauty and the beast when uh, uh uh the the gaston song where he's like telling his little you know sidekick buddy he's like you know i've been thinking he's like a dangerous pastime i know it's like yes it is dangerous what is this huh which one what's your dangerous pastime Oh, the um, well, thinking can be a dangerous pastime. Oh, yeah. But and that, but I was uh, just carrying on with David's joke about uh, sure. asking y'all's thoughts on. Uh, I'd heard a pastor talk about how his church gives him like four weeks, uh, um, a year off, and it was after a busy season. So I think it was after Christmas. I want to say either Christmas or Easter, after one of those kind of peak seasons. And he spends those four weeks kind of on you know quote unquote sabbatical, writing out. Um, at least all the big holiday sermons. So he actually like spends time, you know, in the word studying for the upcoming Easter service, the upcoming Christmas season, you know, uh, Advent, uh, Pentecost, you know, all those. So I was curious, like, what do y'all think? What are y'all's thoughts on Advent? Is Christmas right? Advent is the season of Christmas. Starts like late November, doesn't end till like mid January, mm-hmm. um, and of course depends on which Christianity you're in. But um, the yeah. what do y'all think about like taking the, the summers and like you know studying each of those sections in regards to Rosh Hashanah, you know Yom Tura, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, mm-hmm. and at least having the beginnings of your messages for those high holy days, but just by like taking time to set aside to focus and to study on those particular things about those things not necessarily waiting to be in the season but you know going ahead and getting ready and having your thoughts kind yeah. of you know pen to paper and you know that way when it comes time you'll week of yeah you're instead of spending you know it, you're not it's not you're not stressed. you're not planning an extra or extra several sermons in the midst exactly of yeah exactly i would i would love to say that that would be beneficial for me okay but my brain doesn't work that way. Sure. So, like, I know if I am working on, like, uh, so Parsha Nasul is this week, right? The Shabbat. Yeah. Uh, I can't think about Parsha Bahadotra while working on a message of Parsha Nasul. Sure. Because my brain will mm-hmm. twist that Contl- and it'll mess me up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and, and I'm not, again, like, obviously, like, I could never work a week ahead yeah, yeah. on one. It would just be too confusing to me. Like, I'm, I'm the same way in that regard. But, like, if it's, like, three or four yeah. months out, if I set aside an hour a day for, like, July yeah. to, like, just tackle each one of those. Yeah. And, and not even, like, necessarily put anything fully together. Just to be reading about it and coming, you know, finding, learning things I may not have noticed yeah. before mm-hmm. or, you know, thing that, I, things that other people have said before. Yeah. I um, think it I think it would be a cool idea if... If, for instance, like, and I did this a few years ago to some degree. I, I wasn't able to like plan it out months in advance, but I I, I was intentional on this a few years ago, where uh, you know the 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 fall Moedim are a um, they're a building theme, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so so if you're Rosh Hashanah, uh, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot, and they they build upon each other thematically, um, and so. Uh, I, I actually did a something I rarely ever do, um, but I did an intentional sermon series during the season of the High Holy Days. So the both services of Rosh Hashanah, the Shabbat service in between, both services of Yom Kippur, the Shabbat service in between, and all of the Sukkot services mm-hmm. were all one flowing sermon series that built upon each other. Uh, you know, each sermon built upon the last, and and what have you. And so I could I could see if you were able to arrange something like that. That that would definitely work. Sure. Um, which I've thought about doing, uh, especially yeah. with having uh, Rabbi Toby uh, on staff with us now, because it wouldn't be me having to plan out eight messages in a series, but yeah. the two of us working together, building upon each Alternate. other. Alternate. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just curious what you thought of you know, I guess quote unquote working ahead. In that, in that regard, yeah, um, yeah, I just so that way, because you know, the, I mean, I, there are high holy days I've gotten to like week yeah. of and yeah. been like 
Oh my goodness, I have no idea what yeah. I'm going to talk about. No idea what I'm going to teach. Yeah. About. I've gotten sermon block. Yeah, you got writer's block where you just can't think of anything to write. Yeah, no, I've yeah, gotten tough, sermon yeah. block where it's been like day of. I was in the shower and went, oh, that's what. Okay, that's where we're going to go. We're gonna- yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with working ahead as long as you're still open for God to, to you know. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. because even the best of us can get ahead of God. I mean, I look at the prophet Nathan when he told David, when David said, I'm going to build a house for the Lord, and Nathan goes, oh, whatever's in your heart, David, do it. And God came that night to Nathan and said, hey, uh, no, <laughs> he is not going to build the house. Yeah. Go back and tell him. You know, Nathan had to run back and say, you know, hey, David, you're not going to do it. So, so I actually think that's interesting. You know, we look at these prophets like they were uh, almost like not human, you know, mm-hmm. because they said some really, really amazing things yeah. and some, some really majestic level things. Yeah. I've but, heard some average people say some pretty amazing things. Right. Too. Well, I think that they were average people in some ways. Yeah. I think that they no, were they definitely were, called, yeah. I definitely think they, they mm-hmm. were called to extraordinary circumstances. Don't get me wrong. But like, yeah. I look at, uh, like, uh, you know, I, I look at Nathan as an example of, Hey, even the prophets don't always hear right from God, you know, yeah. and God runs interference. I mean, even Amos was uh, just a fig tree farmer and he gave his, you know, he gave the, his prophecy and then he went back home, you know, to tend his fig tree. So he's a normal yeah. guy. Yeah. Right. But, um, so, so I, I think that as long as you're open to understanding that, you know, because I'm the same one, I don't, I don't work ahead. I, do, I, I generally like, for instance, I'm, I'm speaking, I'm giving the message and, and, Next week, yeah, which is Behalacha, um, and so it's, it's I, Parsha, yeah, I, and I'm looking at that, you know, and, yeah. and and already, and sometimes I do, and oftentimes this is what I do. This is like you know, and this may turn into this kind of conversation, but this is what oftentimes happens. Um, I'll read the Parsha, and literally, like I start talking to myself, mm-hmm. and I start. I, I literally start, you know, like I'll walk around the house and even Brooke will be like, what are you doing? I'm like, <laughs> I, that's just kind of how the Lord, by his, believe me, grace. He, he does it in the Sinai too. We'll be in the office. He'll be working on a sermon. I'll give him, I, I'll give him props for this because he'll, uh, he'll work mm-hmm. like Bahad al next week. Mm-hmm. He yeah. started working on it probably a week and a half ago yeah. uh, in preparation. But uh, he, he'll, he'll sit down at his desk and he's working on stuff. And then arbitrarily he just gets up and walks and goes into the sanctuary. And about 20 minutes later, he comes back in. Sorry, sorry. I I had to get up and walk. I was thinking I was trying to work through this. (laughs) Yeah. And I literally start talking. (laughs) Yeah. And no, I'm, and and yes, like, it's like, I'm, I'm talking the message through like as if I'm giving it, Mm -hmm. but make no mistake. The first person who's getting the message is me. Yeah. You know, like, Somebody will come up to me, and it, it, I think the biggest compliment I get is when someone says, "Man, that spoke right to me." Yeah, and like one lady said to me, "Oh, you were stirring all up in my own. You, you were all up in my Kool Aid today." You know, yeah. like basically saying that you were, you know, that whatever the message was was speaking to her business. What I don't think I've ever heard that phrase before. Yeah, same. <laughs> but I just said, "Well, the Lord's always doing it with me first. You yeah. know, um, I can't give a message about something that I." don't experience like yeah. i can't talk to the people about like for instance if the message is about repentance i can't talk to the people about hey you need to you know always be examining your heart always mm-hmm. be in a state of confessing your sins and repenting and turning from them if but what's been happening is god is confronting me about the things in my heart that i need to turn from and that yeah. i need to confess and so 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 um but yeah no that's what i do like and and it becomes this conversation you know, yeah. and but most and and, and and oftentimes, most of the time, something will happen with one of my kids. Like, yeah. and if you're not a parent, it's it's hard to relate to that. But if you are a parent, then you understand. Like that unlocks this whole new um, way that God speaks to you. Yeah, is through your own children, and especially like Jonathan, yours is still a little baby. Yeah, but when he gets older and starts talking and really making his own mistakes, has and, a will of his own, and he gets a will of his own, then yeah. you really start to see. Then God starts unlocking this because right now you're like in this state of grace with your baby. Yeah, because God will speak to you about that. Because God, like you know, you'll hold your baby, and God's like, "What's he doing for you? Nothing." God's like, "What do you think you need to do for me to get me to love you?" Nothing. God's mm-hmm. like, "There we go." Yeah. Right. So, but but yeah, that, that that I do. But Dave is right. Yeah, like I'll start just walking, and but I don't do that weeks and usually uh, I sure I, yeah. I don't do that like months in advance. Is yeah. what I'm saying. Usually it's like yeah, like David said, like a few weeks in advance. But I don't think there's anything wrong with 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 uh, lining up your ducks. 
um, yeah. as long as you're open to God. Oh yeah, coming and, and, like and I know that you are. I'm yeah. just saying, yeah, and, like like most of my messages are like days before, if not yeah. like I'm not gonna be. I'll be honest. Like sometimes it's like morning of. <clears throat> yeah, that you know I'm, you know, got kind of what I'm gonna yeah. speak on. But well, and that's the thing is, I, I think sometimes we confuse. God's ability to like our willingness to submit to his lead in a message um, with uh, like so that the, I'm trying to figure out the best way to work. So if I if the spirit speaks through me mm-hmm. in a message that comes to me that day, yeah. and I can get up that day and preach it. Yeah. Right. That's me being willing to submit to the spirit and the spirit spirit speaking through me. But the same spirit can speak through me if I'm willing to submit to him in advance too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so if we're prepping in advance, the same spirit, like there are times where I know, like I usually will start uh, looking at a partial so partial. Now, so is this Shabbat. So this past Saturday night and Sunday morning, I was already starting to look at partial and so and starting to, to, to prep through it and, and kind of brainstorm thoughts and listen to what the Lord's speaking to me and, and what have you. Because like Rabbi Toby said, a message better speak to you before you speak to anyone yeah, else, right? Yeah, can't. Yeah. Um, and so I started looking through it. And, and there are weeks that on Sunday night, I have a general train of thought of where that message is going. Yeah. I may not have the message put together. I may not know definitively exactly what references I'm going to use and what connections are going to be made. But I have a general train of thought. Uh, and then, you know, there are, are weeks where by Tuesday, I've got the whole message done. Yeah. But then there are definitely weeks that it's Friday night, Sunday, Saturday, Saturday morning, morning. That you know, and and yeah. I'm I'm not going to lie. There's been times that I've sat in my office uh, on Saturday morning, 45, 50 minutes before service, punching my my sermon reference or uh, scripture references into the slides for the message because it was that morning that I finally knew what God wanted me to talk about, yeah. and and was able to put that message together. So I think there's definitely a variance in there. But I, I think if 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 we are truly submitted to the Ruach, if we're truly being led by the Ruach, by the Spirit, that the Spirit can can move in the same way, whether it's advanced prep submitted to Him or day of. Yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah. And I think there are different brains that operate in different ways. I'd love to say that everybody could prep uh, two weeks in advance, but to be honest, most of the time, my yeah. brain just can't work that way. And mine normally doesn't. Yeah. And I and and it's so it's just something I wanted to try. I was thinking about, well, I've got this summer. I'm not stressed out by getting ready yeah. for my holy days and like all the other things. So let's let's see if that works for me. And if it does, then maybe it'll be something I continue to practice I, in the future. I think it's a good yeah. thing to ref to, to have reverence as a congregational leader, mm-hmm. as someone who speaks from a pulpit or a bema. I think. It is so important to have the utmost reverence for what you're doing. Yeah. Because there should never be a situation where I look at you or David or somebody in the congregation and say, oh, you know, I can put a message together in 30 minutes or I can, well, yeah. one, I can't. But, 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 you know, I think some people get into that group, you know, get into that like, oh, I can just put a message together. I'll just throw a few scriptures up, you know. And I'll, you know. Yeah. And that is incredibly dangerous, and I'll tell you why. Because it's pretty hefty when a person comes to you and says that the Spirit of God spoke to them through something you said. Or when Mm -hmm. somebody changes their life because of something that God... Well, yeah, you said it, right? But God, of course, you're just a vessel. We know that. I'm just saying that if you don't have respect for the process and what the process is, no matter how long it takes, if you don't understand who you're getting it from... You know, and you're lazy about it. Yeah. And you're, you take it for granted. Yeah. Cause I can't imagine being in a situation where I'm standing up there and I'm saying just something from me. Because if it's coming from just you, you know, I think you, we're going to do damage to souls. You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, and so. not necessarily. I mean, you can say your own things and you could tell people, like, this is, this is my opinion on this. Sure. My, I just mean. My thought. Yeah. No, I get what you're saying. I also want people to know. I just that. think to respect the process. Yeah. 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 And it's, I think it's one of the reasons why James tells us, you know, not all of you should desire to be teachers, you know, I, because there's, there is a, you know, w- there is a hefty expectation and responsibility mm-hmm. of, well, teachers yeah. to be able to teach well yeah yeah, well, and, yeah. It, it's this idea of yeah you have to teach well and i i th- th- there's this l- sacrificial t- level to it you know like i've always told brooke i said i would rather be a guy that someone remembered that some guy said this to me and 
God, it changed my life, and I and then them not rem- I'd rather them not remember my name, yeah, than know that oh it was that guy that said you know what I'm saying I heard that one time yeah yeah y- y- or something like yeah that's kind of how I feel I think I, and I pray that I still stay like that because everybody has a tendency to not but like I I, I, w- I was listening I was on um this this morning uh, when I was just doing like some devotional time before David uh, came and picked me up I was uh I, I just I jumped on Instagram and there was this pastor. Um, that does a podcast and he says some stuff that I think is just like, man, I could just do a podcast on just some stuff. This guy says he's yeah. very real and stuff like that. He talks of, you know, but one of the things he says, and I don't want David to take this the wrong way. Cause I know David writes books, but he says, man, I don't, he goes, some of these, he goes, he says, some of these churches, they become book clubs, you know? He goes, the pastor is a bestseller in his own synagogue or his own church, not synagogue, his own church. And, and, and everybody just thinks the way he does and everybody, you know, and, and I was just like, for me, it was just a warning of, okay, you know, you really do have to make sure that what you're doing is from the Lord, you know? Yeah. And, and, and I just like that he said that, you know, because ultimately what he's saying is that churches and synagogues that become, or just places of worship that become centered around a personality, Yeah. you know, and I just don't want that uh, yeah. to be anything that I'm remembered for is my personality, you know? Uh, but I, I thought, and I, I'm not knocking writing books, by the way. No, no, I, I get saying, but yeah, you yeah. know what I mean. It's yeah. like, yeah, it, well, it, and there's uh, been a big problem in the body with, you know, pastors writing books and then, you know, well, heck, you've got uh, a number of big scandals where, you know, big name megachurch pastors sure. wrote books and then, uh, you know, became New York Times bestselling authors because their their church through right. church funds bought a crap bought ton books. of their books. Right. Yeah. And many of them just got destroyed because they sat in storage somewhere forever. But they yeah. t- bought a crap just to get the name up at the top of the list and whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I, and. You know, writing writing books like the the particularly the books that I've written the that I think really matter. Like there's a couple of them that were just kind of cathartic. I did this work, I put them out there, but sure. but like Spirit and Truth, and then the one I'm working on right now, and the One New Man, are books that I really think are messages that need to go out. Right? That yes. I think that the body needs to hear, yeah. uh, but they aren't anything that I think like. I don't stand up in front of our congregation and say, "Thou shalt buy my books." Yeah. Thus saith the Lord. You're not, you're not expecting <laughs> no. to see your books at Barnes. You actually Lord. never. Yeah. Well, he never talks about his books. At I've never heard you talk about your yeah. books yeah. at my service. You yeah, know, and, so. yeah, I, and you know, it, it's it can be misused, mm-hmm. misdone. But at the same time, like when it comes to like you know, um, you know, should a, you know to a degree, I think you know, congregation should take on the uh, the words and identity of its teacher or teachers you know because yeah. uh, that's discipleship you know, uh, discipleship yeah. is about replicating right. replication and if it, you you to a degree you are going to look like the people who are teaching right. you and training you i just don't like yeah. when leaders of places act like they're doing something revolutionary when you're sure when we've we're 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 working off of the ultimate revolution i mean yeah. she has already done something revolutionary right yeah. Yeah. So th- I guess that's what the thing is. It's like I think the the wrong spirit is that we're start is that uh, is this whole idea of starting a brand or a trend yeah. when Yeshua already branded and trended. Yeah, it's not about you, not about yeah. starting a revolution. It's about being a faithful servant, that's, right? And that's you know, oftentimes what well, is not more revolutionary than the cross, right? Yeah, it's it's not, and it's you know, it requires humility to know that. Everything you were doing is the same thing that everyone mm-hmm. else is supposed to be doing, and that. And I think, yeah, you know, and it's you are, um, but but again, I think it's why I, th- I think it goes to the idea of you know understanding, um, kind of like you know joking about the chain of command earlier and some yes. of our off conversations, like it, it's why you know Yeshua tells his disciples when the centurion comes, he's like, yeah, I had not seen faith like this in all of Israel. You know, there's just this. When you understand who's at the top, what your job is, and who you're, and how you're supposed to be, yeah, life just flows so much easier and so much better sure. when you pursue doing that and help others to pursue their end, you know, too. So um, I, I, I don't think we stop. So tying this back to the whole the summer mm-hmm. break, yeah, I don't think that it's a, um, it's certainly not a time where we stop working, no. But we're not getting ahead of ourselves and necessarily like, okay, let's look to Yom Teruah or Rosh Hashanah. Yeah. But I do think, you know, Jonathan brings up a point, and, and, and for me, it's like, man, it's a great opportunity to, of course, take a breather, but also, you know, 
um, you know, do a diagnostic on your congregation and make sure it's healthy and make yeah. sure that, that, that because before yeah. we hit record, one of the things that me and David and Jonathan were talking about was the health of certain ministries in our congregation. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So, but also I think it's, I, I think that's something that the diagnostics is something that needs to be done. Like, on a consistent sure. basis in the congregation. Yeah. Um, I actually, we, we, we don't do it mainly because we just don't have a large enough operation that we have that many things we have to look at on a regular basis. Right. But I really like the idea. Like when I talk to pastors, the friends of mine that are pastors at big churches, one of the things they do is on a, a, a almost a weekly basis. Sometimes it's a monthly, but generally it's, it's a weekly basis. Um, they'll sit down with their, their heads of ministry, their team leaders and all and say, okay, what worked and what didn't work, right? How, what can we do to, to make things better? What is it that, uh, when I was at a buddy's church, I was speaking there one Sunday and, uh, he was standing next to me and worship was going and, and they did this one song and he looks over at me and he goes, well, that song was about three minutes past the spirit. You'll never hear it here again. Uh, cause it, he just recognized it didn't work. And he's like, all right, so I'm going to talk to my worship leader and, and say, right, hey, this is right, something yes, that's right. not beneficial. It's not, it's not moving and where we need to go and whatever. Um, I think there's something to that diagnostics and being able to sit down and say, okay, what's working? What's not working? Yeah. What can we do better? What can we, that's in our, our membership, uh, process for our synagogue. We have a, uh, you know, you have to come for a certain period of time before you can ask for membership. Then we have a membership class that you go through. Uh, and then we have a membership application you have to fill out um, that, that goes through some information on like your background experiences in ministry and congregation life and what have you and spiritual hurts and um, uh, giftings and strengths and whatever. But, uh, but, and then once we have that, we sit down and we go over it and then we have an interview with that individual or individuals and uh, we'll go through their application, the things that are pertinent and, you know, what they're good at, where they see themselves fit in the congregation. But but there's two questions that we ask everybody and we don't allow anybody to cop out. And those questions are, what do you like the most about CMC? And what do you like the least about CMC? Right. And we're very intentional on those two questions because this is somebody that wants to make CMC their home, that they want to invest their time and energy in and being a part of the ministry. Yeah. Uh, so, so knowing what they like the most tells us what areas we're doing really well in. And knowing what they dislike the most tells us the areas that, one, if it's something we agree needs to be addressed, it gives us those areas that we now have definitive like data that this are, these are things we can improve. This is how we can be better. And it helps us constantly move the congregation forward. Um, and so I, I think that diagnostic concept is vital and important but i do also want to to point out that it's it's really easy especially in today's world um with the fact that we've got more and more crap being thrown at us on a regular basis congregate being being a congregational leader being a shepherd in a congregation is in my opinion one of the most difficult jobs in the world to have right now in, in this day and age. I mean, obviously we're generally not always, but generally not getting shot at. So it's not quite as stressful as, you know, law enforcement or military or whatever, but, but there, it, it is a brutal, brutal, brutal job to have. Um, and so there is something to the reality that is, um, uh, rapidly growing and as, as painfully common as burnout is, to take seasons like this, yes, to to think ahead, to diagnostically comprehend yeah. what's going on, Decompress. to 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 maybe start kind of doing some planning towards messages or events or whatever for the holidays coming up, but it's also important to be able to sit back and just go, <sighs> yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, certainly, and, and because you can't. I think far one of the big problems, and we saw it with uh, you see it in some of the um, the the. Uh, rise and fall of of mars hill podcast Mm -hmm. that there were those that because of the scenario that were going on that were in leadership there that were completely burned out but they kept working anyways yeah because that was their job that was what they had to do but you can cause so much damage operating from a place of just being burned out and then when you get out you realize just how much pain you were in and i think we see you know god says you're to work for six days and the seventh day the sabbath is to be a day of rest that we stop and we focus on him and we recalibrate and whatever i think there's something to the seasonal approach to the modim as well that there are seasons where there's big you know repetitive events there 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 are things that are happening but then there are seasons where it's a slow time and granted yes the modim are generally around uh harvest times and so that means that you're actually typically sowing and and working the land and whatever in between but but you have this opportunity to breathe because the real work is in the harvest, yeah. right? And and that's our job as shepherds 
of our congregation, right? As followers of Yeshua, the real work is the harvest, yeah. right? And so we need to be focused on the harvest, but we also need to make sure that we are healthy, uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, that we are healthy. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you, like the last year at CMC, um, we've had some really good times and some really great things that happened. We've had some really miserable things that have happened too. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's, I, I think these seasons in between are great times Yes, for the diagnostics, for the prepping and, and thinking ahead. But I think it's also important that we to rest. take them as an opportunity to breathe, to rest, yeah. to uh, take that sweet relief. Um, mm-hmm. Not take our foot off the pedal so much, but to, to take the time to reflect, to introspect, introspectively consider where we are with the Lord, what he's wanting us to do, some of the things that have happened, being able to let them fall to the wayside so that we can move forward. Yeah. But but I think when we're running, I, I think often we run from busy to busy to busy to busy. And in the period where we're not busy, we think we're supposed to be busy because we're busy yeah. everywhere else. We too. try to fit things in yeah. and make it busier. Yeah. Exactly. And so I, I think sometimes we lose perspective on how to balance that out so that we are leading from a healthy place so that our communities have healthy leadership that isn't burned out. Mm -hmm. Um, I I can tell you when I get um, overstimulated, when I get uh, um, too much going on, when I get too worn out and tired, but I'm still trying to do stuff anyways, that's when I have the higher tendency of of saying something to somebody that maybe it needed to be said, but it didn't need to be said that way. Like That's where I have the highest probability of doing (laughs) that and causing the most harm. Uh, And I think it's important that we as leaders understand those areas of of weakness that we may have so that we can operate in those seasons of rest to be able to um, uh, kind of recalibrate and and hopefully not get burned out and have those things occur and cause more hurt and wounds than than uh, the world really needs. Yeah, that's it's, true. Yeah, it's good stuff. I agree. Yeah. So so as we get ready to to wrap up this uh, this episode, I do want to ask a question since we're talking about it and, and Rabbi Jonathan brought up the concept earlier inadvertently, but brought up the concept earlier when he was talking about the the pastor. He knows that he gets like four weeks off a year as kind of a sabbatical kind of approach, or whatever. Um, I, I'm a part of a a, a group. That meets once a month uh, on on Zoom just to, to kind of talk, encourage one another, build each other up, etc. And um, one of the, the the individuals, he's a pastor of a church, but one of the individuals that's involved in this, um, their church, it's a, a, a bigger size church. I don't know whether it's like mega quality, you know, not mega quality, but mega classified or not. Um, <laughs> it's a quality church, whether it's mega classified or not. Mega classified. But what is that like? Secret, but, ser- secret right? classified. Mega classified. <laughs> but it's but it's a, a, a decent church, and and one of the things that 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 they're very intentional on is that uh, every so many years, their staff members have to go on sabbatical for two months. Mm. Uh, and uh, um, I, w- I was kind of curious your thoughts on that. Like, what would you think about it? How would you? And I, re- I really wish Rabbi Eric was here because I know he's never uh, done something like that. He's never just gone, okay, I'm walking away for two months yeah. and not having anything to do with it. Um, yeah. And, and and in ministry, that's a difficult thing. Like I know of of people. I have a, a really good friend who's a rabbi who, um, you know, tried that for three months. I think it was went on sabbatical, and uh, and it's it's really difficult to completely unplug from yeah. that ministry. And yeah. you, when you're so used to having your thumb on the pulse, yeah. Um, but I, there's also something too that every so often you do need that break. Yeah. And I know of congregations that um, their expectation is every seven years. The, the leadership gets opportunity based off of when they started. Hmm. Every seven years, they get opportunity to, uh, to go on a sabbatical for a month or yeah. two months or whatever it is. What are your thoughts? I think it's important for me and from my perspective. I think it's important. One, of course, the obvious answer is that it prevents burnout, which does happen. I mean, Brooke and I have been burned out. Um, and we've been in situations where we've been burned out and we were not treated with very much. Yeah care or compassion it was just you got to produce in fact um you know i went out of town i I was once complained to about how many trips i was taking over the summer when i had a full-time job in addition to serving at a congregation and it was like well you're going out of town too much i'm like well this isn't my only job i essentially have two full-time jobs you know yeah i said and the summer is definitely when i only have the one job which is ministry yeah in preparation for you know taking that job on again when I was a teacher I had the summer right so I have been burned out definitely know what that's like Uh, I think it's important it's an important muscle to flex as a leader whether you are a 
rabbi or a pastor, whether you're a worship leader, whatever, it's important to lay down lay it lay down the mantle for a little bit. Yeah. Because it's just simply important to know that it that it that the ministry doesn't rise and sleep based on your ability. I mean, because I know people and have seen people who refuse to either put down the microphone, put down the guitar or whatever, or, you know, they'll refuse to do it because, well, because they don't want nobody else to do it while they're gone. Yeah. You know? And they just get burned out. And they get burned out. Yeah. But, like, you can't define yourself by what you do for God. He's already defined. You're defined by what he did for you. Yeah. Not what you do for him. It's not yeah. to say you shouldn't serve. But I think it's important on two fronts, just to make the long answer short, to prevent burnout and also... Man, I had to spend when when Brooke and I were called out of Savannah, going from worship and youth leaders. It was a four year period when we were not doing anything, mm-hmm. and that was important for me because God said, "You have been in leadership for um, five years now, and you've been running and gunning. And I want to know that: Are you okay with just being my kid and being fulfilled, or do you have to have a, a measure of authority?" And I think some people, if they're really honest, couldn't do it without having authority. Yeah. Couldn't do it without having some level of power or prestige, whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it. But I think it's important that that they know that they can not take it or leave it, but you can lay it down for a season. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's just, you know, because that births pride if you can't. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. Because there there, there are times with, like, with authority, like conversations and things that come up that Rabbi Eric and and I'm right there with him a lot of times when he deals with stuff. But there's a little like he's like the authority, he's the one in charge. I'm like I'm so glad I don't have to deal with that. <laughs> oh, yeah. I wish he was here to comment on that because I'm like, but there I, I'm like I really am glad to be you know the apprentice and yeah. not yeah you know, I've not had those moments too, not yeah. the master right you know right now and I'm kind of like I'm like all right. So let know. me ask you in an, in an ideal world, being you two are really the kind of fresher blood in this uh in an ideal world uh, given perfect circumstances as a congregational leader or part of a congregational leader staff um where would one how long do you think an ideal sabbatical would be and two uh how long how many years of service do you think uh uh or, or cycle of years of services do you think is needed uh or, or should be considered for that uh season I think, personally, it depends on how long the sabbatical is. Like, I would not determine years of service to get to that sabbatical until we'd understood how long the sabbatical is going to be. Like, if you were, for example, like... But I think they go hand in hand. I think if you're going to do, you know, say every seven years, one month or whatever. They play off of each other. And I'm not talking vacation. Vacation is different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 yeah, I agree. I'm, you know... I think two or three months. That's me. Two or three months could be good. Um... I think it depends on the size of the congregation, too. Um, I know call, uh, several of my professors in college, they would take sabbaticals, but they would take like nine months to a year. Yeah, I think that's too much. Um, but they were. it was also not just – they weren't just unplugging. They were like mm-hmm. doing research in their mm-hmm. field, visiting yeah. libraries in their field, archives in their field, doing – you know. So yeah. they, it wasn't a tr- – not in, in what we're talking about, I think, where it's like a true unplugging. Yeah. They yeah. were not really unplugging. They were just – it was just a different – I would say wing of their yeah. their work, um, but I don't. Yeah, two or I would say two or three months every five to seven years. That's I, I think that could That's be a reasonable, me. doable uh, timeline. Now I will say I think it can be we in our great American wisdom with how we build, you know, how we how we make you know everything so business like. We try to structure everything as like being like a super hard, and I think there should be like guidelines. You know, it's kind of like parts of the Caribbean, you know. It's not, they're not actual rules; they're more like guidelines. You yeah. know, I, I like having sort of I like having a fence to play in, and then we can plow the field as needed. Um, you know, because for example, there are things that I have on my, in my bucket list that, and for life, that I don't necessarily think. You know, we we, we it, when you come into ministry, you sacrifice a lot. That doesn't necessarily mean you have to give up, like every goal or thing ever. You no. Know, for example, one day I'd like to hike the Appalachian Trail. That takes four to five months, you know. So I'm like, okay, yeah, one day, maybe in 20 years, you know, as, as long as my knees aren't shot, 
you know, <laughs> I'd like to, <laughs> I'd, I'd like to um, be able to say to you know the elders and you know leadership of Bradam and be like, hey, um, I would like to be given leave for six months, you know, and you know, and and maybe would wait, you know, because you know I'm, I'm a reasonable person, you know, and so maybe it's, if it's been ten, fifteen years and I haven't taken any kind of sabbatical, be like, hey, it's been you know been a minute. Uh, I have a goal. Maybe within a year now, let me plan on doing this. And if y'all, you know, could let me. And and of course, it depends a lot on who you have. Like you, like your dad, for example, like Rabbi yeah. Eric, like years ago, could not have stepped away for two months. But now that I'm here, yeah. like he could. That's a realistic and, thing. And you actually bring up a very important factor there, and that is that um, when you, if if you do have a sabbatical system set up mm-hmm. um the consideration for the length of that sabbatical also needs to take into consideration the rest of the team yeah because you take for instance if you've got a rabbi and an assistant and an associate rabbi and you take that senior rabbi out for three months that's three months that that associate rabbi is carrying the weight of both of their roles mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um and so while the senior rabbi is away catching up catching the breath relaxing figuring things out whatever the burden of two positions is on the shoulders of mm-hmm. the associate rabbi yeah. and vice versa. If the associate rabbi goes away for two or three months, then yeah. the burden is on the senior rabbi again. Um, and so there, there has to be a consideration of that balance in there as well sure. yeah. um, for, for that. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, it's an interesting uh, concept. I don't know that it's something that many within the Messianic movement have really – taken the time to consider and i think a big part of that is uh is because of the fact that the overwhelming majority of messianic jewish congregations do not have the manpower to be able to do so you know for most messianic congregations if the senior rabbi went on uh sabbatical for a month there's nobody yeah to run it because they don't have an assistant or associate they may have some capable lay leaders who can kind of tie it yeah but if something were to blow up if something were to go wrong if there was an interpersonal problem Mm -hmm. that could explode the congregation there's nobody there to help fight that battle for them yeah and that's why like i mean even now like for the past you know i'm already kind of like looking at our youth looking at some of our young adults and being like you know who's the future (laughs) well who would i who who do i think i could come go to and be like do you want to be a tamadim do you want to be a disciple and then take them aside you know kind of pluck them out if you will and like pour into them and train them for years so that way eventually like and they may not be the assistant rabbi of Burdam in the future the assistant to the assistant the assistant to the assistant (laughs) assistant to the assistant regional director and uh but you know Uh, having having a pool of three to five you know, and over the years it can grow of people who are trained and qualified to be present, ready, and available to do, you know, a lot of, you know, yeah. even just teachings and studies and things while the senior rabbi is out. Um, because, yeah, I mean, it can't, uh, you, you do, you, lo- you, you actually lose momentum the yeah. less people you have because, yeah. because then, you know, I mean, because like you said, there's just most congregations don't have the manpower to do. First of all, like sabbatical, like forget it. I mean, most rabbis don't get vacations, you know, um, whether it's because of manpower or, you know, or, or what. Um, a lot of them just don't have yeah. the time or the ability to even take a week off, you know, to be just away. Yeah. Uh, or if they do, they save them up to be able to go to Messiah Conference or something. Yeah, which which, and I'm gonna I'm gonna stick this out there as we get ready to close this down. Uh, as a, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna be a bomb. As a a rabbi's kid, and as a second generation rabbi with kids, um, I, I want to stick this out there loud and clear for all the Messianic rabbis and pastors that may be listening. A conference is not a family vacation. A conference is a ministry obligation. It is not a family vacation. Right. Do not take your kids to Messiah Conference or Southeast or UMJC Summer Conference like, and go, this is your summer my vacation. Met. Enjoy. Uh, obligation That completed. is not, because you're not able to devote your time to your family there. You, I mean, some, yes, but yeah. your, your, your attention is split. You're, yeah. Even if you're not involved in teaching or, or leading or whatever, you're there to consume, not to sow into your family. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, and your congregation should not expect, and I think this is more important, your congregation should not expect 
that those conferences qualify as your vacation with your family. Um, you you still need time to get away with your family. Yeah. Your your kids need to know that they are a priority. Yeah. Uh, and and your wife needs to know that she is a priority. Uh, the the conferences are not vacations. Yeah. So with that said, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap this one out today. And uh, thank you for listening to our uh, ramblings as we process through a, a, a lot of concepts of rest and uh, in this season in between uh, the, the fall Moedim, spring Moedim, and, and the little bit of breather and break we have here while also uh, prepping and, and getting ready for what's to come. And we will see you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Messy Antics podcast. Make sure to subscribe so you can be notified every time we drop a new episode. And be sure to follow and interact with us on social media at Messy Antics Podcast.